we're back, we're alive, and she's back. <laughs> Patty Pryor is back. <laughs> Patty Pryor, a professor of geology and geophysics at UH Manoa in the uh, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and uh, Planetology, right here among us. Welcome back, Patty. Oh, well, thanks for having me on the show, Jay. <laughs> this is a continuation. This is research in Manoa, and uh, that is Submarine Research Discoveries in the Marianas, part two. Part two. And as we left this exciting story, <laughs> <laughs> we had these things on the table, and I, I'd like to review them because because one of the staff members came around later and he said, that's the most unusual rock I ever saw. I said, wait a minute, that's not a rock? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is this? A uh, very heavy Don't thing. Don't hurt yourself. No, no. this is, this is um, a bit, and this goes on the bottom hole assembly, basically on the the there are four of them that go surrounding a hole in the metal pipe that grinds out the material on the seafloor as we drill. Mm -hmm. this, this is used when we're drilling through really hard material. But in order to get um, really full cores, and when they, when they use these, they also have to circulate drilling mud and water, and so it kind of washes things out of the hole. And, if you were to do this into soft stuff, you'd be losing a lot of material. So what they do instead is initially they just use a pipe with kind of a beveled edge at the tip, and it goes through the center of the drill bit and pushes ahead of the drill bit. It's using it. No, actually it's not turning, and that's, that's the critical thing. Ah. They, use, they actually use a piston, and the piston... Pound it. The piston is released and suddenly the whole core shoots down into the formation and brings back most of the time a hundred percent of the soft material. Then we keep doing that until we can't get any further and then we go to what's called an extended core barrel, so an XCB and this is kind of like, well it's not really a bit, well it is a bit, it looks like but a it's got little, like yeah, a it's got little teeth. Bit, yeah. Yeah, these are these. Or a steel have, one. Yeah. yeah, the outside is steel, and these guys are. I think they're tungsten, and um, I forget exactly what they are, but they will then rotate and basically drill into the slightly so, harder material. So, oh, this is for the harder material. This is for the softer. Material. No, this is for the very hard material. Oh, okay. okay. I didn't. I don't have anything to show you for the advanced piston coring, which is just it's just a metal pipe with beveled edges on the top to make it a little bit sharp. And then inside all of this, um, both the, the piston coring um, device and the extended core barrel device, there is a metal pipe and then inside that there's a PVC pipe. Mm. And the thing about the advanced piston coring is that it's so powerful that it can shoot as much as nine and a half meters into soft material. Wow. But if it gets a little bit harder, um, strange things happen. Like? Like, like uh, this. Can you folks see this? This actually is a piece of PVC pipe, and it was twisted like this when, when the piston shot out. Because the material was so hard. The material was too hard, and there was so much friction that the PVC pipe got very warm, and when they tried to pull it back out, it just basically twisted like you know taffy. Yeah. Just sometimes so it melted, it's amazing. Yeah, melted and, and twisted as as the pipe rotated. Can we get a shot of this? Okay. Okay, that's the that's the the PVC pipe, which yeah. is which is plastic, transparent plastic. It's yep, interesting. That's right. Yeah, we put, uh, we put these marks on the side so we'll be able to saw it in half exactly. So you can see exactly what happened to the material. Yeah, and you can look through and see and the this material. One, I, I didn't, you know, you're very strong. <laughs> Although I noticed your hands were shaking a little with the, with oh, the yeah. weight of this. But I, I would have a problem lifting it up. I'm going to try to lift it up now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, heavier yet. Yes. So this thing, gee, this must be, oh, 30, 40 pounds. It's really heavy. Probably 25, 30. 25, yeah. 30. Yeah. Okay, and if you look, if you can look into the, 
that thing, that's, that's where the, what, what goes in there, the shaft? This actually, um, we have a couple of pictures that I can show folks. This, this sits on, um, basically on holders. There are, there are four holders around the center of the drill pipe, and there's one of these on each, and they're facing inward. So they, they face inward like this, and then they, they grind away on the rock as, as the drill is uh, pressed down. It's so interesting. It. The outside is, you know, rough and tough with mm -hmm. all these uh, dots on it. Mm -hmm. we, we decided, by the way, <laughs> this was reminiscent of a candy oh, yes. way back when, where, where you had a three-inch strip of paper, uh -huh. and then there were dots of sugar, sugary stuff on it. <laughs> and you'd peel off the, the dots with your teeth and eat some of the paper because the paper came yep. off. Yep. And the FDA would never approve that today. But. Never, ever, <laughs> never. Not with all the mercury in the paper. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. The paper's the problem. Anyway, I, I'm getting, my arm is getting tired. I'm not sure I can <laughs> hold this. Okay. So <clears throat> this is really, this, oh, and, and by the way, what makes it exciting is there's one of those dots in the top. The, the mm. very top one seems to be worn down. Yeah, it's worn off. You can imagine off. the pressure yeah. involved. In yeah, this, that's you know. true. What does something like that cost? Any idea? Ooh. Mm, well, <clears throat> mm, per day, well, about $100,000. You mean in the whole operation the whole of operation driven? Of okay. Driven, yeah. And this, this I, comes with it. The, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much the, uh, the bottom hole assemblies altogether cost. This is not okay. as heavy. This is, yeah. this is a little lighter. Yeah. A beautiful machine, machine work in it. It's a beautiful piece of gear. It certainly is. When, when, when we can't use it anymore, you could make something out of it, maybe a lamp. I certainly could, yeah. This, is, this, is, this is paperweight for my office. Yeah, you can, have, you can have as much paper as you want. This <laughs> will hold it down. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> That's right. Nobody comes and messes with my papers. <laughs> now, what's, what's the, uh, the head ah, over there? This thing, this is a standard styrofoam head. And I usually use these things when we have open house at the university and up at HIGP. In fact, we're going to have open house this October, so people can come and, and I hope you let us know. We'll we come do. with a camera. Great. Okay. Um, this was a normal size, you know, head, uh, and this one oh, I, this is I what put the water pressure. Yes. Yes, that's oh, right. Wow. I put this in a remotely operated vehicle that went to the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point in the Mariana Trench. And of course, it was just totally shrunken and shriveled. So the, the kids that come and look at this, uh, just feel what it looks, feel, feels like. You know, when you pick up a styrofoam head, it, it feels really light and, yeah. you know, almost airy. Light, yeah. The kids always think that that weighs more. Because it's compressed. It just feels it's denser, you know, so yeah. they think it weighs more, yeah. but it actually weighs the same, same amount. Because yeah. it's the same amount of material That's as right. the big one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it's wait, an interesting. Is Modigliani, isn't it? Um, hmm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's take a look and see if you agree that it's Modigliani. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Certainly, it's it's uh, it's not Venus de Milo. So how many feet? <laughs> how many atmospheres down there? Oh. Um, it's about, well, we said this last time, uh, imagine 16,000 pounds per square inch. So, you know, it's either an SUV or an elephant on a pogo stick on your big toe and all over your body. So that, that's what And this it does. is how many, how many meters or feet down below? That's almost 11,000 meters. It's 10,924 or, or so. Meters. Meters. Mm -hmm. That's just like huge. Over seven miles. Seven miles down. Yeah. And so this is at the bottom. These guys are at the These bottom drilling. These guys can, uh, the drill string on, on the Joides Resolution can go to 10,000 meters. Then what happens? Uh, and then it can go, I think, about 1,000 meters. It has that much pipe. When, it, when it's fully loaded, it has that much pipe. But um, there... The deepest that I know of in terms of touching the seafloor um, is in the Mariana Trench at about, mm, about 8,000 meters deep. I think that's about what it was. But there, there may have been deeper uh, drill sites elsewhere that I'm not aware of. 
just wondering, you know, if a ship, mm -hmm. say an 18th century ship, say any ship, yeah. was crossing this area, mm -hmm. and for some reason a storm, who knows what, yeah. it, it, you know, it lost its watertight integrity and sank, right. would it go to the bottom? And what would happen to it on the way? Sure it would. And uh, anything that had air in it, um, would be crunched, you know. Um, any any hollow, <laughs> more more sort of more like that. <laughs> okay. I, I got it screwed on. Good. I think that's what I think. Patty is trying to tell me we need to take a break. <laughs> Let me take a short break. Okay. A little water. We'll examine the bottle more carefully. Okay. And then we'll be right back. That's Patty Fryer. We'll All be right. right back. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. it's just about. Yeah, I might have to come back for a third. So let's come back and. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff. MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Right, because this is a sharp end. Okay, we're, we're back. We're live. We're examining these, these uh, drill bits. And uh, Patty tells me that, um, she whiz, uh, neither one of them will ever go down again because uh, they're, they're past their they're prime. They're worn out. They're worn out. They're, they're retired. <laughs> and so she may very well make paperweights out of them. <laughs> we'll put them in the this Smithsonian. One, this one was used on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge on um, Expedition 305. And we were coring through very, very fresh unaltered and extremely hard rock. Is that the same kind of like hard rock you'd find on the surface, like granite, for example? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, you have some photos that I we do. can sort of, you know, show this and demonstrate exactly what it looks like. Why don't yeah. we try the photos now? Okay, let's do that. Yeah, the, the very first picture is of the ship itself sailing out of Honolulu, and occasionally it does come here and um, if folks want to visit the ship, mm -hmm. they can, if, you know, if they're not incredibly busy offloading and stuff, they do have uh, tours of the ship. On occasion, best to get in touch with somebody from the university. And, and that uh, tower is the tower, it's like an oil well tower yes. because it's sinking the pipe. It's uh, exactly. turning the pipe. It's, it's the derrick. So if we look at the next picture, Oh, that's the two chief scientists that were out on the uh, cruise 366. That's me in the pink shirt and my buddy Jeff Wheat, who is in the other shirt. So we were making decisions as to where to go after spending almost 13 years discussing with the drilling program um, the, the protocols, the, the necessary data, and so forth. That's what they call operational control of the vessel. Yeah, that's true. You may be a scientist, and there may be a captain, but you're telling him where to go. That's true, but he's telling me yes or no if the, the waves <laughs> are bad or the weather isn't <laughs> cooperating. And the second, uh, the, uh, the second picture that we saw was of the drill floor itself. Well, can we see that again? Where, where the, the pipe um, is put together, and then the next picture shows, um, I forget what the next Oh, yeah, there we go. There's the drill bit before all these little nubbies get worn off and that dark uh, metal thing. This looks like thing. something out of a Transformer <laughs> movie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It looks really mean. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the black thing coming up through the center of the drill bit is the advanced piston coring pipe. 
so you can see the beveled edge at the top. So uh -huh. that's, that's upside down when it's actually yeah, operating. Yeah, yeah. The next one is the drill bit that's used for you know that, hard just rocks. Just one more look at that. Look at, you know, look it looks at how like it's sharp smiling. those teeth are. It's got a smile. You see think? Can, yeah, it's oh. got a smile. Anyway, yes, and the, the teeth are somehow coordinated. Are they moving or what? Yes, they will, they will rotate. And as they do, they grind away the rock. And they leave the area right in the center of the four bits. Um, that's the core that we re recover as the drill pipe advances down into the seafloor. So the, the, the motion of those three wheels mm -hmm. yep. is caused by the motion of the pipe itself? There's no uh, motor no. or anything. Oh, yes, or is, there is. There yes. is, oh. Yes, uh, these rotate as the entire drill string rotates. And that is controlled within the derrick by the drillers. Can you see, as a scientist, you know, with operational control of this, can you mm -hmm. see it? Is there a camera or something down there? How do you know what's going on? Uh, the drillers tell you, you know, there's all kinds of things that they're measuring. They're measuring the pressure on the formation. They're measuring the resistance of the drill bits to the material that they're, they're penetrating. And, and they have all of this arrayed on um, just a huge um, digital screen that they've got, you know, every single aspect of what's going on down what's there. What's fun? Yeah, the heave of the ship. All of that is controlled by the um, the the top drive um, and the uh, heave compensation system, which is a bunch of bunch of tubes with air in them that try to keep the pipe from you know crashing into the the seafloor every time so we take away. Yeah. And so they're reading the heave, yes, and then compensating and how yes. they're uh, uh, and uh, that's done. That's done basically the automatically. They're not controlling the heave. The heave is controlled by by what is actually happening on the seafloor. How do, how do I get on this uh, ship? How, you know, what do I have to study? Who do I have to call or write to? Anybody, absolutely anybody, can write a proposal to take this ship out to sea, and collect core samples. And what you have to do is you have to um, fill out all of the appropriate forms, of course, right? <laughs> and then, then you write a rationale for why, scientifically, this is important. And uh, that proposal then goes through a whole series of scientific advisory panels that are staffed by people who have similar interests, people who have very different interests scientifically, people who have experience with the drilling program itself and having gone to sea on the drill ship and know whether things are going to work the way the person who's proposing it sets or hopes that it will work. And uh, once you have gone through all of that, you go to a safety panel that evaluates whether or not there are any potential dangers or problems with actually drilling, also whether or not this is an area that's protected, it's like either environmental environmentally issue. or just that it's in you know somebody else's backyard, someone Legal someone else's uh, sovereignty extended issues. economic zone. China, you wouldn't do right? this in the South China Sea, for example. Actually, they are doing it in the South China Sea Who's right there? now. Who's the Chinese or us? No, with the drill ship. No kidding. Yeah, they had actually. To get permission? Yes, and we have um, partners now, who. Um, contribute to the funding of, of the expeditions. And we had two Chinese, actually three Chinese scientists on the cruise that I was co-chief for. So you not only have to, you know, get uh, permission to get on the ship to, mm -hmm. I guess, lease the ship or r rent yep. the ship, you also have to pay the rent. And that's another mm -hmm. whole issue about yes. getting funding, funding for, right. what did you say, $100,000 a day for the uh, drilling minimum. experience? Yeah, right. Give or take. Yeah, give or yeah. take. So you have to, Six there's two applications involved. That's true, and um, because this is an international program and we have partners from a variety of nations, uh, they all chip in to help pay for the ship. So the ship is leased to the um, International Ocean Discovery Program now, IODP, and then from each country that contributes, a certain um, number of scientists can be invited uh, from countries that contribute more. More scientists can be invited. It's an honor, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's yeah. a great honor, yeah. um, a privilege, yeah. and a tremendous amount of fun. <laughs> you see, you can have both at the same time, <laughs> honor, privilege, and fun. Oh, yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes left, and okay. I want to get into the question of what you pick up there. Yep. 
and what you do. And I know there's you know, that's a lot of material to discuss in a few minutes, but pick one. Pick one kind of material that opened the mm. Proustian keyhole for you. Okay. Uh, I'll pick two. Pick two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pick not going to take these out because they're really muddy. But um, if the camera can get a look at this, these, these are bits of the material that came out of the core liner mm -hmm. when we were coring at the mud volcanoes that I'm interested in. This material is basically bits of the hydrated mantle of the earth. And the rocks and the mud that we were recovering tells us about the, the physical composition, the, we can measure temperature down the hole, um, we can um, drop instruments down the hole once it has been cased with a pipe and leave them there for years on end and determine what the characteristics of the contact oh. zone between the subducting plate and the overriding plate are. And that's where the biggest earthquakes on the planet occur. So what can you learn from that? I mean, you know, to me, you know, you take a little sample, yep. a little experience like this, it's this big, but it, it is miles high in terms of its value and the kinds of things you're, what can you learn? Well, this is the only way that we can learn about what the physical characteristics of that contact zone are, because we have no technology that can drill down 18 kilometers into the area where the downgoing plate actually touches the overriding so plate. So you can learn about the mechanics of the subduction. The mechanics, yes. And what it does to the material right. that's being subduced. Is right. that the right word? No, but Subducted. that's a nice word. <laughs> we can deduce <laughs> what the subducing deduce does. Deduce the seduction. There you go. Watch it. <laughs> We're getting the endangered This is territory. a family show. <laughs> Yeah, what we can tell from this are the temperature, the pressure, the chemical composition of the contact zone where these major earthquakes are taking place. And some of the rocks that we brought back that were, were dragged up, basically erupted from that contact zone, we can see the nature of deformation within those rocks. We can see cracks in the rocks. We can see what filled the cracks, you know, what, what minerals what are the what are the characteristics of those minerals do they slide easily do they not slide easily would they help or would they preclude earthquakes you know there's just so much information that we can get out of just tiny little it's pieces the, of rock it's a geologist's paradise it's a dream come true dream come true <laughs> yeah. you can not only find the rocks but you can you can figure out what forces yes. what have to do to change that how, exactly. the, the, how they react to heat how they react to pressure all those things that's right now what, what does this tell us for example about other subduction zones or other you know geological phenomena one of the things that we're very interested in is the fact that on the east side of the mariana trench there are a whole lot of ancient seamounts you know big big seamounts i mean you know 3,000, 4,000 meters high. And these things are being subducted. And there's uh, a lot of argument in the scientific community right now about whether or not they cause earthquakes or whether they stop earthquakes by changing the um, physical characteristics of the surrounding stuff. So these things are being subducted all over the subduction zones around the Pacific and the Atlantic. I mean, all over the world. So, so where does this lead us? Does this, this lead us to understand earthquakes more? Yes, definitely. Definitely. I mean, so, so theoretically, mm -hmm. we could we could put sensors. I mean, sensors is all the technological rage these days mm -hmm. in science. Yep. Put sensors down there, or somehow sense what's what's happening in Zone B, mm -hmm. not in Mariana, but Zone B. Sure. And see what the the, the readings are and then figure out what is going to happen or what is happening right now right. In, that, in the subduction possibilities of that second area. Right? That's correct. What we can do uh, as soon as we get instruments down in the cased holes that we left in the Mariana region, we'll be able to um, follow the changes in chemistry of fluids that are coming up out of the downgoing plate. We can collect them in these tubes that just collect them for years. And so then we can slice the, cube, the tubes up and figure out, okay, d 
Does the composition of the fluids change when there are earthquakes? That will tell us what mineral phases have released fluids. We'll be able to tell by the composition, okay? So then if we have a seismometer anywhere near this area, if there's an earthquake, we can determine whether that produces a pulse of fluids. Does that help earthquakes? Everybody thinks that the more lubricated a fault zone is, the more likely it is to give way. And so if we can, we can track those kinds of changes, we'll know a whole lot more about the instantaneous changes that are required uh, in order to create an earthquake. And, that, and uh, my goodness, we have earthquakes yet, yet to come here in this planet of ours. We sure do. That could be devastating, so we need to know more about them. To, to deal with that devastation or that, that risk of that earthquake. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, what about minerals and vegetables? What about new compounds, new rocks mm -hmm. that you haven't seen before? Mm. What about, um, you know, the cure to cancer? Is it down there? <laughs> well, you, can you find new yeah, things down there? Yeah, we think so. <laughs> of course we think so. We need more funding. No, I'm teasing you. But, but yeah, indeed, um, the microbiologists who were on this expedition were incredibly interested in finding out because these mud volcanoes can tap um, the most unusual chemistry that we've ever found in the oceans. And how does that affect the parameters of life, the, the limits of life? Can animals actually live down there? One of the questions we have is we know that there are microbes that are going down the subduction zone and the microbes that we find in the mud volcanoes, some of them are unique, but some of them look an awful lot like the ones that are going down with the subducting plate. And so one of the questions one of the microbiologists is pursuing is whether or not the animals, the microbes, are able to ride the plate down and then come back up the plumbing system of the mud volcano. And how they do that. And how they do that. Because there may be you know, mechanisms, biological mechanisms, that allow them to do things that we haven't figured out yet. That's for sure. <laughs> it's a whole new world. It's, yes. It goes way past Captain Nemo. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, but you are right. You know, both um, things like cancer and Alzheimer's are things that uh, people who are interested in pharmaceuticals from microorganisms or from uh, macroorganisms on the seafloor are looking into. I mean, the, the fish that we talked about last time that can survive at pressures that will do this to a styrofoam head, um, the, these animals have chemicals in their bodies that um, protect their tissues from those kinds of pressures. And those are the same kind of chemicals that people are using now to treat Alzheimer's. So oh, how, can, how can we springboard off discoveries such as that Who in order to be able to that help. A chemical that protects you from water pressure mm -hmm. also could help you from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But there it is. I mean, so, you, you know, you find one magical compound somewhere, mm -hmm. it could have implications there, somewhere you never, and so there's, there's a world of research to be done, Patty Cryer. Oh, so much. It's, we're only at the very beginning So here. much research, yeah. so little time, Jay. So little time. <laughs> Well, we'll have to continue this discussion. But the last question I want to ask you is, yeah. so suppose, you know, I was watching this, mm -hmm. and I am watching this, mm -hmm. and I got very interested yeah. in this sort of thing, and I wanted, to, I wanted to be a student. I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to be just like you. Oh, my goodness. How would I do that? How would you do that? You have to go back a few years. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the most important thing, I think, for any scientist is never to forget to be curious. And I know that you're curious, Jay, and that's a <laughs> good start. Um, to understand all of you know, the, the materials, the, the background in, in terms of the science, stay in school, enjoy school, whatever topic you enjoy, follow that through. For me, it was rocks from the very <laughs> beginning. But, but you have also to be persistent. And there are a lot of things that, that get in the way of uh, people advancing, you know, through through their interests to a career. And the most important thing, I think, is to love what you do, you know, and make sure that you do what you love. Yeah. And once you decide that, you're in, in, in the great uh, dichotomy. It's the follow-through and the others. 
Two kinds of people in the world, the ones who follow through on mm -hmm. their dreams, their aspirations, their yeah. passions, and the others yeah. who don't. <laughs> and then you get to go and get these things for paperweights. <laughs> Thank you, Patty Fryer. Oh, thank you for having me. Wonderful to talk to you. We had to do this again and again. We had to follow your career and <laughs> all these fabulous discoveries you're going to make. Oh, well, thank you, Jay. That would be fun. Come back soon. This I is saw. Patty Fryer. She's a uh, professor of geology and geophysics at UH, and she's in a, in a wonderful place for professor of geology oh, and geophysics. Sure. There was an article, what did I saw in the last day or two, about how UH had incredible research facilities. We don't realize. I mean, oh, we yeah. did. The, you know, the population, the people of Hawaii don't realize the, all the inf incredible things that UH is doing. This is one of them. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Jay. Anytime.